Welcome, everyone, to um, Evening at Pod Camp with a concentration on food tonight. Um, I'm joined by four friends here of the foodie, blogging, and internet world and new media world, um, and I'll let everybody introduce themselves. Hello. My name is Terry Dowd, and I have a blog called Parmesan Princess. I also co-host a cooking TV show called Between the Eats, and most recently I started a marketing and sales consulting firm that's also under the name Parmesan Princess Inc., and I'm so happy to be here today and talk about my journey. Follow that up. I'm Chris Dilla. I own Locktown Beer and Grill. We're in the Robinson area here in Pittsburgh. Uh, you can follow me at Locktown on Twitter. Uh, we're obviously on Facebook as Locktown, and personally, I'm um, uncapped, uh, U-N-C-A-P-D. I haven't used a lot of Twitter lately, <laughs> um, but I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, but I use social media very heavily with my business to say in communication with my customers and to bring in new business. Look forward to the discussion. My name is Laura Jackson. My blog is FriendlyPittsburghFoodie.com. You can also find me on Twitter, at Laura Elizabeth J, Instagram, FriendlyPGHFoodie. And I am a yoga teacher and food blogger here in Pittsburgh. And I love to recommend restaurants, especially brunch. But I also do restaurant recommendations for lunch and dinner. And I'll be talking more later about how I'm tying my yoga teaching and food blogging together for the next step of my food blogging journey. Uh, my name is Tasha Aiken, and I have a Pittsburgh food blog called The Food Tasters. Um, and The Food Tasters, for about the past year, has partnered with the um, Yajagoff Humor Blog, and um, we have the Yajagoff Podcast. Awesome. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, Easy question first. What is your favorite part of being a foodie media specialist? I coined that name tonight. But okay. <laughs> I like that. So what's your favorite part? Start with me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I would say my favorite part is figuring it out. Um, I laugh now when I look back at, which I'm sure you can all relate, like your first photos, your first tweets, your oh, first yeah. Facebook post, your first blog, and you're like, wow, have I grown? And then, you know, you see along the way those moments where the light bulb goes off and it's like, oh, that's how, that's how you do that. That's how this looks crisp and nice and, you know, get people to follow certain topics. So I think the growth of it is just my favorite part, just seeing it all grow. I think for me, it's the feedback. It's not necessarily all through social, but you do get um, sort of just the, you know, I don't want to call it the likes, but the, you know, the reassurances that you're doing something right or uh, that you're doing something stand, that stands out and gets noticed. So when you get the attention, you get the interaction, or you even just get honest feedback, um, sometimes it's not all positive, but you get something, uh, a real conversation out of it. So I think I, that's important to me because not everybody walks up to you in the restaurant and tells you, you know, how they feel about the food. Awesome. My favorite thing is the connections, whether it's meeting fellow food bloggers in person, befriending them, um, even meeting restaurant owners, restaurant managers. You know, there have been a few restaurant managers and owners that I've really developed some deep connections with. So it's great. Like, Pittsburgh is such a supportive community of one another. So that's definitely been my favorite thing is just making connections for the foodie world in Pittsburgh. Um, well, a couple of things. I like finding, um, you know, little places that maybe not everybody is talking about and, um, you know, finding something really special on their menu to share with people that maybe they would not have found mm -hmm. on their own. Mm -hmm. um, so I like getting, you know, that kind of feedback from people. Um, and I'm, I'm also kind of a natural critic, so this kind of gives me an outlet <laughs> for that. <laughs> and we all agree the food, right? Oh, yeah. Of course, the food. The, food. the wide is, array of food that we that get to try. That is definitely a favorite, too. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, well, in that, um, tell of a fun time that 
uh, working in food media affected your visit to a restaurant or how you changed your owning of a restaurant due to it? Okay. Like something fun that ever happened, like an ironic situation. I figured this would be fun story time. But it's fun story time, but I don't know that I have it yet. I got the thing. <laughs> Somebody else go first. Um, I guess I'll go first. So, well, something positive that happened last year, and I think Tasha knows the story. Terry might know it. I'm not sure, but Tasha definitely knows. So a really fun story. Last year, I went to Bar Marco. My mom and I went to brunch. This guy walks up to me. He has like a backwards baseball hat and cargo shorts. And he's like, friendly Pittsburgh foodie, high five. And I'm just like, who are you? <laughs> How do you know me? Are you a fan of my blog? Who are you? So, so I started watching him, and he was like pouring water to the you know, fellow customer on my table. So I'm like, OK, so he at least has to work here. He's not some crazy guy off the street. <laughs> he definitely works here. So later on, I see him like sign for a package at the, at the door. So I'm like, okay, well, he at least has to be a manager. We're getting somewhere now. We're, we're connecting the dots. So then he comes over and he brings my mom and I like a uh, breakfast pastry basket for free, complimentary. And I'm just like, are you a manager here? And he's like, I'm one of the owners. And I'm just like, oh. <laughs> and... Um, in, and, and that guy is Bobby Fry, the former man, um, owner, one of the owners of Bar Marco in the Livermore. He's now has the swing truck, food truck. He's getting ready to open up another restaurant in Greensburg called Oddfellows. Mm. That was great because that was him taking the initiative to come up to me, where it's usually the food blogger coming up to the restaurant owner. That's awesome. And we've developed a friendship ever since. Like... I can email him at any time, and he'll give me feedback on an upcoming project. He's always very positive. I never would have thought that I would have developed such a connection. So that really means a lot to me, especially since he was like, um, oh, I love everything you post about my restaurant. It makes my day when I wake up in the morning and I read something positive about the restaurant. I just want to thank you so much. That was like something that, I mean, that totally changed my view of Bar Marco. Because he made it special. It just wasn't a regular brunch. He made it special. Like he brought out a bottle of wine. The three of us shared it. He showed us the wine room, gave us a tour. I mean, how many restaurant owners do you know give you a complimentary pastry basket wine bottle and tour of a special <laughs> event room? That only like, it's like a six course, $120, you know. I can't follow that. I'll you know, <laughs> that's, that's, that's hard to follow. But he, he took that extra step, and I remember that because not every restaurant owner does that. And especially if you're a food blogger, that is important because we remember that stuff. We remember how you treat us. And if you treat us well, we will promote your restaurant and we will promote you no matter what you go on to do in the future. So that's very important, and that's like a story I definitely wanted to share. That isn't, um, I'm, not, I'm not really trying to answer the question too, but that brings up a point just about social that's in good. general, just the um, idea that we are real people, whether we're communicating online and mm -hmm. that's how we met first, or mm -hmm. that we're just real people building relationships in a different way. It's not like a handshake and a networking event mm -hmm. we're meeting through social or, mm -hmm. you know, you've written something and then somebody mm -hmm. comments on it and then mm -hmm. you meet them out in the real world and develop oh, a yeah. real relationship. Mm -hmm. um, you know, real friendships are, mm -hmm. oh, I don't know, just... Somebody could get a flat tire out here, and we could tweet out and find somebody to come help us in two minutes. Yeah. You know, because we know each right. other now that way. We trust. I, I've made a lot of friends through Twitter because I've met somebody who's met somebody who's met somebody. Then you know, mm -hmm. oh, okay, that's all right to sit down beside and talk to John there. He's no. okay. <laughs> He's, He's okay. not really a jack <laughs> He's actually a very nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, that's what the point of that story was, was that like um, with blogging and podcasting and food media becoming more and more prevalent, um, is are you finding it to be a moment where you're getting recognized, where you're getting seen the second you walked in? And then do you find it's affecting you being a good critic? That is a really good question because 
because I'm not anonymous and because I do have my picture on my Instagram and my Twitter and even on my about page on my blog. Um, not necessarily when I first walk in, but I might hear something towards the end. And there was one restaurant that's not a local restaurant, they're a chain restaurant, but they do have a restaurant here in Pittsburgh. From the moment I sat down, they were like, please write a good review. Oh, how do you like this? Do you like it? How do you like it? I'm just like, you need to take a step back, like, because I need to do it my unbiased opinion. And, but then again, if you're standing right in front of me, ask me how I like it, I'm not going to tell you I think it sucks. Like, I like, I, I mean, but what do you want me to say when you're standing right there? So, have you thought of um, taking your picture down so that you can do it? I mean, I've only had that one experience, so I really don't feel like it's necessary because most restaurants will respect and they'll say, like, I hope that you give us a constructive review. And when I do my posts, like the way I do things, if I don't like a restaurant, I just will not cover it. Um, I do give constructive feedback, but it's not like I'm, I'm here to help the restaurants, not make them go out of business. Sure. And I want people to go to the restaurant. So I'll, I'll be positive, but I will say things like, I like this dish, but maybe it could have used this or... Um, you know, this night the service might have been a little off, but all the other nights it's been great. So maybe they were just having an off night that night I, I went. Like, I try to keep it very constructive, but, but positive, too. Well, if the restaurant knows that you're a food blogger, mm -hmm. you are absolutely not going to get the same experience mm -hmm. that you would if they did not know that. That's absolutely right. So, you know, for the first five years of the food tasters, you know, we tried to remain as anonymous as possible. Now that we're working um, with the podcast, we're able to actually go back, you know, to those places that we've been to anonymously and have liked and have chosen to promote. And, you know, since we've already sort of vetted them, we can work with them in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, the, the reason why when we started the Food Tasters that we wanted to be anonymous was because of that, because we wanted a truly authentic experience. Because we look at everything from the cleanliness of the bathrooms, which reflects the cleanliness of the kitchens, to, you know, the service and the food. And, you know, we might go someplace, you know, two or three times and not post anything about it until, you know, we've decided that, you know, it's some place that we, you know, want to help promote. Now, in the past couple of years, um, with all of the new restaurants and how, you know, elevated the service and the food is, you don't find, you know, that as much. You know, you're going to get really good service and really good food mm -hmm. no matter what, no matter who you are, because they take a lot of pride and you know, you're spending maybe a little bit more mm -hmm. for that. Um, but still, you know, you, you, have to, you, you have to know that you're not going to get, you know, a truly Same authentic experience. experience. Yeah, mm -hmm. even, if, even if you just get, you know, like something comped. You know, that's not something that someone just off the street would get. Mm -hmm. So if you're going in and you're covering that, you know, for blog purposes, or if you, um, you know, get a special dish that's, say, not on the menu. You know, that's something that you, you know, it's kind of difficult to write about that or to share that because that's not something that someone from, mm -hmm. you know, the general public is going to be able to walk in and that's have true. that experience. And I've had that a lot where they've been like, oh, oh, this is not for on the menu. I made it just for you. Yeah, and that's which that I make sense, really. Which, which, <laughs> I, which I love, and I do share it, but I do make a note that... This was an off-menu item. Um, this is not something they normally do, but I still wanted to share. So, so that's true. Like, you're not getting it fully authentic because they do know. So it's like, you know, the pro and the cons. You know, I mean, no cons, honestly. I love being a food blogger. <laughs> but but the, Tasha is right. You don't get, like, a truly, off, like, unbiased experience. There, is, there are added touches. I love the added touches, but there are added touches that make it different from the regular person walking off the street. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I'll just say um, for Parmesan Princess, this started as a way for me to write recipes, show my food photos, do all those kind of things. And then I fell into the food blogger category and I started going to some restaurants and writing about them anonymously, like never even would say anything about, you know, oh, I'm going to write this or something. And that was truly authentic. And once your, your cover's blown a little bit, it is harder because you don't want this special treatment. And I know I've been with Tasha at least a couple of times where, you know, it was just almost disappointing because it was like we wanted that service and you walk in and it's like, oh, Parmesan Princess. And I'm like, oh. Like, how do they know we're here? <laughs> so we did like, not email. Yeah. So I think that was, that was part of the crossroads between, you know, I do a new recipe practically every Friday or maybe a restaurant post. Mm -hmm. The restaurant posts have been something that 100% blows me away, mm -hmm. where I'm just somewhere and something blows me away, mm -hmm. or something that I think is really cool to share with others. But most of the time, it's the recipes. And I think that crossroads between do I want to go down this path and do I want to do all these restaurant reviews and do all this, that was part of the part that was the part that I had trouble with that actually I was like, no, like if something's really great, I'll do it. But I found that really difficult to to keep that line because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I know a lot of people that mm -hmm. they feel like they have to. Oh, yeah. They feel like they mm -hmm. have to. Oh, well, they gave us a bottle of wine, so whatever. Mm -hmm. No. Like, you know, and like you don't want to hurt anyone's business, but then right. you don't want to, you just want to not, I always say if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all mm -hmm. is the best rule. I think so too. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, if something really blows you away, I think that's, to be communicated, oh, yeah. and that's what it should. Yeah. The platform should be for, not to go in and get free shit. <laughs> I, am I allowed to say? I don't know how to say no, that. because I'm perfect. I hundred percent agree with you on that, Terry. <laughs> I mean, stuff. <laughs> and, you, and you find this that the family show, I'm <laughs> right? And so, so as the first one to lay out the words, I mean, I'm usually well, there are worse words. So there are. You're right. That's um, so okay. right. <laughs> so you would find then also that once your cover is blown, do you find that it affects your personal life? Like it's a night that you're quote unquote not working and you're out on a date or you're out with the family or something. And all of a sudden you're like the manager is at your table or some, or the chef or whatever is at your table. Really, but. Just because I'm one, like if it's friends of mine, no, and that's the thing. Like Laura tagged it a little bit when she said, you build these relationships well, mm -hmm. even though I'm not going to restaurants all the time, I'm still building relationships with mm -hmm. the people in the industry because mm -hmm. of what I do. Right. So I'm building the relationships and say hi and everything, but I feel like it's not obnoxious at all with me personally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if people say something, you can kind of, you know, back it off. Like just your body language. I want to say like, mm -hmm. you know, your, your body language mm -hmm. is kind of, you know, Oh, mm -hmm. Hey, how you doing? Yeah. Turn back to what you're doing mm -hmm. or not like, Oh, I had the steak last week and it was, and then you're like engaging in this whole huge <laughs> conversation. Like I'm just kind of like, Oh, Hey, yeah. and then go back to my, right. you would feel like, Oh, what's new? What's your new menu? Then you're working. Yeah. And I did have trouble, you know, it's like, do you take a food photo of everything I just recently stopped doing that more because I was, it was like every single thing that was put in front of me, I was photographing just in case I wanted to, I wanted to write about it, but it was like working. Yeah. So I think for my brain, mm -hmm. I need to differentiate. Mm -hmm. I think we all do. I think that it doesn't even matter if you're in food or not. Yeah. The, yeah. You know, the, the mini celebrities, everybody can be famous, you know with social media so you have mm -hmm. to have that time where you're not mm -hmm. doing what everybody thinks you're doing you just have to be human you have yeah. to go to the grocery store you have to go to the bathroom you have yeah. to eat your food because you need nutrition mm -hmm. not because you're trying to yeah. actually blog about exactly. it exactly you know? so yeah just taking the time to put the phone down and yeah. be you know being the, yeah, no, i'm kidding no you know, i am like oh, oh she, she told me to put the phone down oh, <laughs> <laughs> i mean like just you know maybe you want to go out with her and just talk about something else in your life yeah and then you are both being expected to, you know, I don't know. Tweet and yeah, yeah, analyze yeah. what you're doing. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. you know, you're just hungry, you're thirsty, yeah. and you're having a visit. So, I don't know, it's just a good lesson to say we, we all need downtime. Exactly. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Fine. Um, okay. How does the current state of Pittsburgh restaurant and foodie obsession have helped or hurt you? Mm -hmm. 
I think I'd go first on that one. Oh, uh, yeah. I was, <laughs> yeah, I was curious to see your answer on this, actually, when I wrote this question. Um, I think there's a lot out there. It's so overwhelming. There's a lot of noise out there. Um, uh, we were just talking a little bit beforehand about how a lot uh, there's so many restaurants with craft beer now. When we opened 10 years ago, uh, craft beer was something you had to pull out of people. Like, they didn't know what I was going to put in that cooler that we have. And now that it's... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like that boom mic Moving came. microphone. <laughs> like, I need to talk. Anyway, so, never mind. Uh, there's just so many places to go for the exact same thing, product-wise. Yeah. You have to do a lot to stand out. Mm -hmm. um, you can just look up on Twitter who has whatever one off a of beer, and somebody's going to tell you you could probably stop at five different places in one night. Mm -hmm. It used to be something that would be, oh, you have to go to Bogtown, and you're going to wait three more weeks to get it. And this is the night we're going to do it. And so you can, everybody can get everything instantly, get the answers instantly. Heck, they can look up uh, you know, a food item while you're sitting there eating it and find out how it was made. You can quiz the chef and ask him, and he doesn't even know how it's made, and you can <laughs> criticize him. You, it's, everything's just so instant right now. I think it's hard to be stand out in that regard. We are not in town where everybody else is, so I think we have sort of our own little advantage of, well, not that everybody's in town, but our own little advantage of being unique out in the suburbs, so the people that just don't want to make the trip in um, mm -hmm. can still have that type of experience, mm -hmm. but even still, it's just harder to hold people. There's something new opening every day, and I, you have a voice, like social media, you're, you know, your voice and your age and your expertise, that's what you have to protect, I think, on, mm -hmm. on social to still be, mm -hmm. you know, the expert. You've been doing it better longer, or you've been doing it um, you know, you've been stretching your boundaries and growing over that time. Other people are just starting. They might have all the bells and whistles and all, all the beers, but when you walk in, do they have the good service? Or, you know, or do they have um, knowledge about the products? Uh, are they going to still be there in a year? I don't know. I mean, it, uh, we were talking earlier before we got started about places that have 150 taps or, you know, are going to have that many. And I, I have trouble with kind of corralling enough interesting things just with 16 taps. So when you get that big and have that many beers, it's a lot of inventory. Mm -hmm. How interesting is it all when you have that much of it? You know, mm -hmm. I don't know it's like yeah, the whole room was full of candy. Would you still want candy? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And then, um, so I like to kind of guide them to the choices I want them to have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's our voice. I think that's where my voice is right now. Um, mm -hmm. It's to stay outside of the pack, I guess, a little bit. As far as the beer goes, and on the food side, we do things we've been doing all along for ten years with local and grass-fed beef, and um, a lot of places do it. But it's, you know, do they do it well? Do do you trust <clears throat> them to do it? So um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm getting lost a little bit, my thoughts, but it's uh, it's hard. It's hard. There's a lot, a lot of voices out there right now. Yeah, like in addition to a, a new restaurant popping up, for what seems like every day or every week mm -hmm. at least. It seems like there's new, you know, a new food blogger popping up on oh, Instagram. Yeah. At yep. least one per day, and um, they confuse you too, right? Because the names couldn't be that far off. Well, yeah. Sometimes I'm surprised. Of, I can't believe that people are finding new names, new user, you know, handles for all of these food <laughs> blogs that are out there. But, um, you know, you're sort of curating you know, your selection to people. So, you know, I, I'm trying to do the same thing. Like, I don't I don't really go to restaurants that everybody is already talking about because they don't need my help, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, you know, we try to find the places that, that do need a little bit of help, and those are the ones because I've always wanted to help promote locally owned, independent small businesses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't generally... Um, you know, even eat at national chain restaurants, mm -hmm. um, and certainly not, you know, like fast food restaurants. So, you know, there are a few, um, you know, now that we're kind of branching out, you know, there are um, a few places that we've worked with that are national, but, um, you know, they might be serving local beers, mm -hmm. like um, Anthony's pizza. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to a beer dinner there because they were doing having East End Brewing and pairing it with their mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. So if there's an angle like that, you know, I'll, um, you know, check a place like that out. But, um, 
yeah, we're like I'm trying to find the places that don't necessarily already have all of the hype and you know media covering them, um, so that I can sort of curate you know some selections for our followers as well. Just like you're sort of curating your well, it's somebody, beer selection. Somebody that's like your expertise and your point of view is going to stick with you. You know, and you have to you have to culture. You can't own all of the content. Everybody's going to be out there saying something. So right. what can you own? It's your voice and mm -hmm. um, it's your your own social media presence. I mean, mm -hmm. that I think the one hard part right now is that there's not any more people in this. I mean, I'm sure the population's grown. Somebody's got that number somewhere, but there aren't hundreds of thousands of more people. There are a lot more restaurants and a lot more beers. So we're all getting a smaller piece of that pie. And on your side with the blogging, there's no limit to how many people can be talking about it. So right. how do you stand above the noise? You really have to have, you know, a strong point of view and something that somebody is willing to get behind. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. in their personality, whether it is, you know, whether it's TV personality or written uh, sense of humor, whatever it is, it has to be strong. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm just fortunate that, you know, I had the desire to start doing this almost six years ago and right. not right. yesterday. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so we've had time to build up our followers and we have, you know, mm -hmm. pretty loyal following and um, people trust us with our, Absolutely. you know, our mm -hmm. recommendations. So, and I think I've only ever had one person come back and say I didn't like that place and it was a restaurant owned by someone very famous in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you know, I... Even things can go wrong, you know. There, mm -hmm. like things are going to go wrong once in yeah, a while. Sure. But if, yeah, I've been very lucky with, um, mm -hmm. you know, building and being able to maintain a, yeah, mm -hmm. a loyal fan base. Um, I think that all this growth and everything, it just really goes back to what's happening in Pittsburgh, that you know we're on the map and it's not only for food, it's for tech, it's for innovation, it's for everything that's coming out. Mm -hmm. And like Tasha said about, you know, capitalizing on the fact that, you know, she has this following and Chris mm -hmm. saying, you know, well, we have this and we see where this might go wrong with some of these new places and mm -hmm. this is what we offer. Mm -hmm. I think everyone's forced to reinvent, but mm -hmm. forced to take that look at yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, Definitely. oh, I just don't have a blog. Like, Laura, what you're doing now with the yoga and the, it's like, yeah, there's going to be 10 people going out there doing restaurant reviews at the same place you are for brunch at the same time, it seems like within a couple months, mm -hmm. how is yours going to be different mm -hmm. and how can you move it to another level and really mm -hmm. differentiate yourself? And I think everyone's in this innovative state right now mm -hmm. of changing logos and names and mm -hmm. writing about different things because oh, yeah. you have to. Right. Um, and it's kind of neat to see. Like, I think so. You know, it's like, these people who are the pillars of food blogging and food in Pittsburgh, I mean, they're getting a little shaken up lately. Oh, yeah. And, they you are. know, things aren't like they, they used totally to are. be. The white tablecloth red sauce restaurants aren't where everyone wants to be. Millennials right. want to be in these new places. Right. So it's like, even if you're not a new place, mm -hmm. why are you different? Mm -hmm. You said, mm -hmm. you know, we serve this, we mm -hmm. have this, mm -hmm. we have this. And you look to people to... Get that out there, yeah. mm -hmm. and the millennials so. do come. I mean, like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what a millennial is, but yeah, they, they, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's all but, right. They, I mean, we do get new people. There yeah. is somebody turning twenty-one every day too. Yeah, right. um, and don't, don't discount the new people that are coming on. They yeah. might have been writing in a different industry, yeah. uh, have plenty of their own expertise, maybe yeah. from another city. Yeah. Um, and I guess there's room for everybody. It's oh, just yeah, a matter right. of. How many people have time to read it all or eat it all or drink it all? <laughs> That's where I get lost. Like, That's why I think everyone has to step up their game a little bit yeah. because there yeah. is this competition where there might not have been competition in the space right. years ago. Right. There's heavy competition and mm -hmm. only a couple of people are going to monetize and move up and, mm -hmm. and do what they're doing and everyone else is just going to have the food blog, you know? <laughs> so yeah. I will say that for my blog, like I started off pretty much just writing about a handful of the same restaurants. Then it got to the point where I try to do mostly new reviews every post, except for the few restaurants that I feel are exceptional. And I might try something different there that I didn't do, do before, that I feel like it's new information. Mm -hmm. But similar to what, you know, all of these ladies touched on, now I'm getting to the point where it's like, 
going beyond the blogging, what's my next step that makes me stand out? Um, where I can combine my yoga teaching and my food blogging together. You know, that's, that's what I'm kind of starting to explore now. It's like Terry said, making yourself stand out because every single flu blogger is going to have a meat and potatoes review or is going to have a review of the Vandal, you know, those restaurants everybody's reading about, you know, you know, uh, so you do have to find a way, whether you're a restaurant or a food blogger or a media person, you have to find a way to make yourself stand out. What can you offer that the next restaurant or food blogger or, or media outlet is, is, is not offering? So um, my actual final question kind of catapults off of that. With all blogging becoming so current and podcasting and all this Insta media happening constantly, what do you think is next for food? Other than smell really, vision which was said really earlier. <laughs> Smelling through our, our phones of so the food. Did, now what have you said earlier before we got started? I'm not telling all my secrets. <laughs> that was, that was <laughs> Terry. I know. No, 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 so I'll tell you what's next. We're just going to have to wait and see. Um, okay. <laughs> no, that's I'm, fair I'm, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm very much about the idea of sharing because if we don't, mm -hmm. I, 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 any kind of thing, any kind of, I don't think we're in competition. No. Not me and you, or myself with another restaurant. Yeah. My competition is bad weather. My competition yeah. is the fact they're going to close the parkway. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's this, the way you know, you know, the, the, we, There's plenty of people that all need to eat. We all need to get up and eat every day. Or, you know, we're all looking to go out for a date or a weekend things. So that, I don't think that I have competitions by other restaurants mm -hmm. being them. We should be in it together. Or mm -hmm. um, it, as we're all trying to learn about mm -hmm. how to use social media or what piece of tech isn't working to communicate and why everybody mm -hmm. exits off of one platform mm -hmm. to learn from each other for, mm -hmm. for it. Um, but what's next in food, I think, is that we're going to be into more alternative proteins. And then we've gotten to that point where we know what GMOs are. We've gotten to that point where um, we don't want, I don't know, chicken McNuggets. Or, you know, we know we know what food is. We're educated. <laughs> <laughs> you can have all the chicken McNuggets. <laughs> what were you eating the other night? I forget. Did you, were you eating chicken fingers? <laughs> oh, you were eating the mushroom. The mushroom. See, there you go. <laughs> see, <laughs> see, 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 you were eating real food. Because you didn't have chicken fingers? No, we don't. Matter of fact, we had chicken fingers and we took them off the menu and I can't believe the blowback. I don't want to sell chicken fingers. We mm -hmm. just, like, they're there for little kids. Some adults have figured that out and they still order them. Like, please eat something better. I mean, we, <laughs> we, 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 we hand bread. We <laughs> hand <laughs> We and bred them and sell them, but I'm, that's like the last thing I want to sell. And then I guess it's just—I hate to say it—it's it, kind of like junk food or whatever. People just—it's mm -hmm. comfort, comforting yeah. to some people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I do believe alternative proteins, or at least better source proteins, are important. Mm -hmm. And again, without all that insta everything, mm -hmm. that you can learn about the food and you can learn what a GMO is or what a nit what what nitrates are and why mm -hmm. they're in foods or why they shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. um, the consumer is much more educated. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I just saw, I can't believe I saw it, but Arby's is said, it was, venison, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ar Arby's is going to test venison, uh, which I love venison. I live in the woods. Mm -hmm. um, every time I hear, you know, somebody's out there hunting, I hope they're going to come over and give me some of the meat my husband doesn't hunt. But I don't know about Arby's. I, I can already see that it's not going to work for Arby's. It's probably just a, a thing to just get people talking about Arby's. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I wish it, but I, but I think people are going to call it the baby sandwich and not buy it because well, the it's first too thing, fast food. Yeah, the it first thing in Bucktown, mind. not in Arby's. Right. And I think that it's just, you know, them expanding on the we've got the meat thing. I love that stupid <laughs> saying. You know, so they're going to yeah. include venison. But the first thing that popped in my head was... A, you know, roadkill deer. Mm -hmm. You know, that's... <laughs> like, I'm not going to eat venison at Arby's. Right, but so we, can, we can purchase <laughs> through regular but, food channels, we can purchase venison and put it on the menu. It could be center of the plate. And we can, But if they're going to make it... Either they're going to be successful with it and then everybody's going to eat it like they eat beef. Like, we've never been successful with rabbit either in this country. It's delicious. Mm -hmm. And I can buy all of it, but it's so expensive, even sourced mm -hmm. from a farmer. Um, it's not worth it if three people mm -hmm. are going to order it. I need it to be chicken, beef. I need to be as accepted. You know, mm -hmm. chicken, beef, turkey, things like that that people just are willing to eat, no questions asked, mm -hmm. um, to get it to be worth it, mm -hmm. basically. So what's the difference? Just raise your hand. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> what's the difference between that and, like, if I go to BRGR, 
they have like a variety of different kinds of meats that I can select from. Mm -hmm. So why is it okay in that setting, but not in other settings? I have an answer to that. Okay. <laughs> what, um, why, why is it okay to have... No, why, why is it figured okay to like, I can go to BRGR and I can have a, a bison burger, which bison isn't anything that I would consider the traditional, you know, beef, pork, sure, chicken. Sure, sure. Um, but you can't do that at Arby's, is that what you mean? Well, I can't do that in other locations in general. Um, like. I think it's just the demand's not great enough. Like, if I'm going mm -hmm. to stock it, I have to buy it in such a quantity that it would either uh, perish before I could sell it, um, unless that's all you have. Like, you, you're directing somebody to buy just A, B, or C, you can sell it. But when you have, you know, you're trying to please everybody with all sorts of normal proteins plus adding those in, I just don't think the volume would be there um, for it. I mean, uh, bison's more reasonably priced, I think, than grass-fed beef at this point. And we do carry grass fed. I actually buy a whole cow, and you know, go through the whole process of deciding if we're going to butcher it all the ground or if it's steak quality uh, each time. But if it's steak quality, I can't only sell you know it's one cow, so I have like you know a fillet this big, so I can't have that all year round. So I mean, I go through all wow. these things. It has to be something I can constantly get, reorder and reorder to make it worth it. So I think bison's just not there yet. Um, we like duck. Duck is widely available. Mm -hmm. Love duck. But yeah. it's it's something we just do occasionally on the menu. Mm -hmm. So you as a restaurant owner and us as people that like to go out and eat a lot. I, I find <laughs> Come on out. Every day. <laughs> and and I've, I've worked in restaurants for 20 years. so. But I find that to piggyback on her question, what the answer I have is that people are a lot more apt to try venison or elk or buffalo or ostrich as a burger than they are ordering an elk chop okay. or, a, or a bison ribeye or a ostrich I agree. Steak. That's it's, a great big, it's a much more expensive buy, right? Mm -hmm. And also, you're not sure if you like it, so you're not, you, know, you don't know if you want to go all in. Also, you're going to be more willing to trust me, or at least my full service restaurant, than you are going to be willing to trust Arby's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or yeah, also buy it at the store sure. yourself mm -hmm. and, and cooking an ostrich sure. steak at home on the grill by yourself. You're yeah. more apt to try it out. Than mm -hmm. That's true. Even I don't. Yeah, I don't buy a lot of. Uh, I love elk and all that. I don't buy a lot of that at home either. I tend to get them out at a restaurant where I think that chef has uh, invested himself. He has expertise. Mm -hmm. He bought it for a reason. He wants to showcase it for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why, I like BRGR and stuff like that, and do things in a burger. People who are apt to try burgers or just the whole chop. And I think that's their marketing to have like that variety of burgers. So when yeah. you go in there, they have to have flashy stuff. Like when you go to the hot dog place, it's all sanctuary. You know, it's like all the you know all the different kind of hot dogs. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm like, okay, what other restaurant could we possibly? <laughs> I'm teasing. You know, the hot dog place. Them. I wasn't going to say any no. names. I absolutely <laughs> love French where it was a grass fed. But we, we, my husband and I eat a lot of grass fed, so we try oh, every place yeah. that has something like that. And they, they I've never even actually been there. Oh, no. The one in Lawrenceville is really cool. Inside. Yeah, the one in Lawrenceville, I like the downtown one too, but the Lawrenceville one's nice because it's larger mm -hmm. and they have an expanded brunch menu compared oh, to the downtown okay. one. It's neat, funky space. I do have an neat. answer to that question too, as far as where I see the food direction in Pittsburgh going. Um, I have an answer for both bloggers and with the restaurants. Um, as far as the bloggers, and it's already happening, like Tasha and Terry are, and you, Amanda, are examples where not just the writing, but with the podcasts and the videos and the TV shows, like people like visual. Um, the podcast is great because you can listen to it on the T. You can, you, you can like, Listen to it while you're getting ready for bed if you want. Like, it's something simple you can pull up on your phone and you can easily access it. You know, Terry has her Between the Eats videos on YouTube. Something else, you can, sim you can simply pull it up on your phone, mm -hmm. watch it while you're, you know, putting your meal together at home. You or can, Thursday nights at 7. Or 4, 6, 3. There you go. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was say your TV like something just to do. TV show is <laughs> what, what channel? 463 in Pittsburgh. <laughs> in Providence, Rhode Island. You can watch us on CW28. <laughs> I'm not going to go through every city, I promise. <laughs> and food bloggers, you know, 
they're also evolving like, you know, Tasha evolved into the You Jag Off podcast. Now she is doing like producing and directing. You know, Terry evolved from food blogger to TV host. Now you have this company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm starting to get into events. So mm -hmm. there's always that next step to take. Yeah. And I think it's important, as I said earlier, to differentiate yourself. Um, as far as the restaurants, this has been happening more in the past year or two. Um, very similar to what, like, Michael Paul Pollan preaches. It's And similar to what other people said, it's about the consumers being more educated, knowing where their food comes from. And you see more and more on the menu, this, this dish came from this local farm. Um, I, you know, like like the Heritage Farm, for example. Kira and Bar Marco both use them for their chicken. Uh, Clarion Beef Farm. Bar Marco uses them for their uh, brunch burger. So it's, it's becoming about you. The consumers want to know where am I getting my food from? Is it locally sourced? Also, what's becoming very important is is this like a carnivore dish? Is this a vegetarian dish? A vegan dish? A gluten free? Mm -hmm. Like. It's, it's becoming very prominent on the menus now, and that goes back to people being educated and more concerned about, well, am I making good choices at the restaurants? And I seriously feel like if you don't have at least one vegetarian, at least one vegan, at least one gluten-free thing on your menu, at least one, then you're missing out because that's a demographic that's going to be like, well, I'm not going to that restaurant. I think there should be multiples. It's hard. Yeah, it's it, it, there should in be most multiples. places. There, there are. I mean, yeah, I, that's a, that is a. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even think that's something coming up. I think that kind of it is. It is on menus or it mm -hmm. does exist, and that the staff of restaurants mm -hmm. are taught to. So mm -hmm. even if it's not written down, yeah, I've got a gluten free person here, mm -hmm. chef, mama, let you know, mm -hmm. and then they have like ways to order it, and make sure mm -hmm. that they're learning the kitchen. Mm -hmm. They also know what they can offer to the customer, it might not be written down to them, mm -hmm. but it's getting to the point where there's so much, um, I don't know what the right word is, responsibility to it, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. who's responsible for it? The person who has the reaction, the server who's half paying attention, the cook who didn't see the GF written on there, you know, whose, whose job is it? I, honestly, it's a person that's eating job to know what mm -hmm. foods are made of, Definitely, but Definitely. You know, like, it's, like they don't have to sign a contract to go out to eat. It's, mm -hmm. That's a hard part. That, I mean, yeah. it, it's it's a touchy point with me. Like I, mm -hmm. I don't know that that's new, but I think it's a new responsibility. It's a new thing that we all worry about, and it takes a little bit of the time away from all, all mm -hmm. the fun, fun experience. My husband and I uh, try to eat paleo. You can't tell by... <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't say that. <laughs> no, I mean, like, I'm not okay. losing 60 pounds or something, but... Um, but just eating clean, and I uh -huh. think that would, if, if we could turn what you said into something that I think is down the road, we know the word clean even right. now. Mm -hmm. I was like, no, I, I try to avoid everything mm -hmm. with, um, what do you call it, preservatives in it. Mm -hmm. um, I grabbed a couple of potato chips over there, and it was like eating like a special ice cream cone treat because I don't mm -hmm. really eat them, you know. Mm -hmm. um, anything that you don't know what's what's in it, you just mm -hmm. avoid it. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people, when they want to go out to eat, have mm -hmm. to forego, they have to literally let go of that. Yeah. It, you, you're going to end up with mm -hmm. breadcrumbs or bread or flour, which is one of the biggest things of paleo, no grain, mm -hmm. um, and it just sneaks in on you mm -hmm. no matter what. It's it's almost impossible to go out to eat. Right. So when you do go out to eat, you kind of got to leave that healthy yeah. cooking yeah. kind of thing. Or you have to be those, a little flexible. You have to leave that at home. You have to be flexible. You know, or, or stay mm -hmm. home and cook for yourself, which mm -hmm. is fine too. But and not that I meant that it was up and coming, but if you compare Pittsburgh to other cities... We're not at their level yet when it comes to having those options. We have them more now than we have ever, ever before, I will say that, but we're not at the level yet compared to like, um, like even like Las Vegas, for example, DC, like, good, or good, 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 DC, um, I mean, parts of New York City, not necessarily Manhattan, but places like Brooklyn, like the more quirky artsy areas. Um, even parts of California. Um, I mean, it, it might be unfair to, to compare Pittsburgh, but, you know, like like I said with Michael Pollan and the Food Inc. documentary, that's when I first found out and started questioning, well, where does my food come from and what am I eating and how are the animals treated? Like, that's really important. That's all really important to me now. Yeah, well, and that's I, your voice, though. That's, yeah. that's what sets what your, mm -hmm. you know, your vision apart from somebody else's blog mm -hmm. between yoga and mm -hmm. clean eating and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and where's the food source from? That's that's mm -hmm. your voice. That's, Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Okay. That wraps up this evening. Um, any questions from the audience? Do we have a little bit of time? No? <laughs> okay, does everybody want to give one more time where they're from and their Twitter handle or how they can find you? Sure. Yeah. Um, Tasha Aiken with The Food Tasters, uh, thefoodtasters.com, and The Food Tasters on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, and also You Jag Off Podcast on Instagram and Twitter, and yajagoff.com is where you can find our podcasts. Lovely. Laura Jackson, FriendlyPittsburghFoodie.com is my blog. You can also find me at Laura Elizabeth J on Twitter. Friendly Pittsburgh Foodie is my IG Instagram ID. I'm Chris at Blocktown. Um, also uncapped U N C A P D. It's my initials and it's a play on top of the beer and being a little more personal there. And obviously Blocktown actually at the restaurant. Come visit and talk about all kinds of social media with me any old time. Um, <laughs> Yeah, at Bocktown in the Robinson area. We're across from Target on the North Fayette side of the point. So. Um, Terry Dowd, and I have my blog is on ParmesanPrincess.com, and I have Parmesan Princess Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, Fresh Grated Parm. And the show is Between the Eats, so we have Facebook, um, Twitter, and Instagram. We're all over all. I didn't name all. <laughs> I know. We're, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram. <laughs> um, and our next event for PodCamp is actually another food um, event. So PodCamp Boot Camp will be focused on food blogging November 19th at the Beachview Library at 6 p.m. at night. So, and that's all. Thank you. <laughs>